So for our audience who is not familiar with you, can you just let them know, like, who are you? What do you do and what's your background? Got it. So my name is Leah Dias. I am from Inglewood, California. I own the Girl Cave LA, which is a chain of beauty supply stores. We have, well, now we're getting ready to open up our sixth location with locations in Southern California and in Texas. Um, so I do that. I also own a franchise juice bar. I um, have a property management company and I have three kids and I'm also a wife. So I juggle a lot. And I'm just, I like to think of myself as just someone who's a creative who got into business and that's what I do. Dang, yeah. that's a lot. That yeah. is a lot. It's a lot going on. And I, I just kind of want to know like, so what was your first venture? So really my background is in social work. That's what mm -hmm. I got my degree in. And so really what I like to do is I like to fix things. I like to solve problems. And so my first step into business was when I got married, my husband had a juice bar that wasn't doing well. So I used to take my weekends and kind of like play with the numbers and figure out what was going wrong. And when I, when I finally realized that I had a knack for it, then I went into the beauty business. And that's when I started the Girl K Ballet. Mm. Yeah. So I got a question, like growing up, had you ever been exposed to like entrepreneurship, any type of business or anything like that for you to be able to just pick up that knack so quickly? Right. So my grandfather was, um, I mean, he was just a Renaissance man, to be honest with you. He was one of the first builders here in Los Angeles. He got so many projects done, buildings that are still standing here in Los Angeles. That's who he was. So he was a developer. So I got to see somebody solve problems every day. And then my mom, who was his daughter, was the same way. She was a wife and a mother, and she had a full-time job as a nurse, but she also had a side hustle where she um, went around to YMCAs and swimming pools, and she started certified people to become lifeguards and, and CPR certified. So I always saw my mom and my grandfather just like not being okay with just having one piece of the pie and always mm -hmm. wanted more. So I think that's where that comes from for me. So yeah, it was, uh, I grew up in a very, very, um, I don't even know how to describe it. I just grew up in a household where like you just couldn't be happy with just one thing. Like we mm -hmm. were always being pushed. And not in a way that was like overwhelming, but just in a way that challenged me as a person. So it was good. Yeah. I had a good childhood. And I think that's that's really important, especially like for coming up, because a lot of times in today's climate, you'll see like kids, they'll be like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Like, and a lot of times I call it lazy. I'm going to just mm -hmm. call it like I see it. I see a lot of kids either being lazy or they, they cry a lot. They complain a lot. And I just think, like like you said, being pushed whenever you're coming up, it kind of makes you a little bit more well-rounded, but it also allows you to face your fears a whole lot easier too, because you're able to be exposed to more things. Right, yeah, I think it. part of it is a, a lack of um, you know effort, like being lazy, but I realized that a lot of it too is just people not feeling inspired. They don't think they can do it, so they talk mm -hmm. themselves out of it, you know what I mean? Especially young people um, that I've worked with um, all of my stores, I hire young black women. And just to know that people put limits on themselves at such a young age, I'm like, no, you could, you could do anything you want, honestly. So yeah, I agree. <laughs> I like that. Man, so I really want to hop into it now with the, the girl cave. So Leah, with the, after you, you got like the juice bar together, like how was the process of getting the girl cave together? Like, did you just like, be like, okay, I want a beauty supply. So like what made you choose that industry? Well, okay, so we were talking earlier, like you guys are from Louisiana. When you go to beauty supply stores or you go into a lot of businesses in black neighborhoods, you don't see black people that own them. Right. Not so it, for me, growing up, right. So for me growing up in Inglewood, I would go, you know, get my hair, my braiding hair for the weekend. And I never saw black people working in the beauty supplies. And I used to always question that. And so when I decided I wanted to take the leap into beauty, I said, well, why is there a beauty supply on every corner? Everybody got to be making money because they would be there for years. Mm -hmm. like, there were stores that would, you know, they were there when I was a kid. So I said, if they can do it and they could be sustainable in my community, I can do it too. So I opened up my first store literally minutes away from where I grew up in Inglewood. So mm -hmm. that's it. It was just a desire to kind of do something that I grew up around and didn't see anybody like me doing it. OK. And can we kind of get a little bit deeper into that now? Because I've never really known anybody that looks like us to own the beauty supply store either. Like right. you said, it's mostly like Asians that come into the hood. They have the uh, they set up shop. They got the one on the south side, the one on the east side, like they get their families to run it and everything. So like 
whenever you're in the process of that, what did that look like learning about that industry? Because you can't just jump into it head first. Like, what did you have to actually learn in order for you to be successful in that industry? Yeah, so I really, it was a lot of like, like they say, guerrilla marketing. It was a lot of mm -hmm. guerrilla research. I would go into beauty supply stores as if I was a consumer and look, like look at the packaging, look at their systems, spend a lot of time in there. So that was part of it. And then the other part too is there's a lot of information available online. And I think as black people, we hear that, oh, black people are, are locked out of this industry. Mm -hmm. So we don't do the research. And so I just started digging up. It was a year's process of doing research, but I started going to these distributors and finding out what they needed from people to set up accounts. And um, yeah, I made a lot of mistakes though. I'll be honest with you in the beginning, but it was really just, 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 trial and error. That's what it was. It was no mentor. It was no like mm -hmm. self-help book or anything like that. It was going into these stores and figuring out how can you, how can you start a business and be in one retail space for years, 20, 30 years, right? And still be sustainable. Um, so just figuring out how they moved and how they worked. And um, I got kicked out of a few beauty supply stores. <laughs> hey, but I love it. I, I love it so much. Cause like you saying with that gorilla, that gorilla research, we had another young lady come on this podcast, uh, Trishana. She has a roll ice cream shop and she did that same thing. And I feel like we really do underlook like how much you can learn as a business owner from looking at other people's businesses. Like you can go in and just start. Cause as a consumer, like, I know you said you went in with your consumer hat on, but like, at the end of the day, you had just learned all these business skills with that juice bar. So like you could really break down that business like a different way. So I guess I'm just saying all that to say like, I need people to understand that you, like that's one of the biggest things like, cause you're saying so many of us don't want to like try things cause we don't think we can. Right. But if we just actually like take those steps and take the actions then you can start seeing some progress. Yeah, I agree. And I just think that you have to, information just doesn't fall in your lap. You got to be creative on how you find it. And so for me, I was like, well, if I want to learn about a beauty supply, I need to go to beauty supplies. I need to see, you know, when are they receiving stock? How are they receiving stock? Is the owner carrying it in? Are they getting it delivered? And if they are getting it delivered, what truck is that that's delivering it? Is it UPS? Is it an outside vendor? So these these are all things that I did for ye like a year, literally going into different beauty supply stores and seeing their processes and how it worked um, and just being creative. Mm. And whenever you were also in that process and you started speaking to these distributors trying to get products, was there like something that you saw across the board, something they were looking for? Was there like a minimum that you had to pay in order to get this into your store? How did that look? Yes, yeah, so I think what I learned is um, and I'm not discounting anybody that has been racially profiled getting into this business, but my experience is that they, when I say they, I mean the Asian distributors, the Asian hair owners, uh, product line owners, they don't not work with black people because they don't like black people. They're not trusting of anybody else outside of their, their group. So yeah. once you show them that you're trustworthy, then like I have great relationships with my distributors now because I pay them on time, right? So a lot of them just have product minimums and they want you to spend maybe a couple thousand dollars at a time to establish your account. So that's when we talk about um, getting your foot in the door. Why I switched over to a franchise model is because sometimes these product minimums can be a lot for a new business. If you have 10 vendors and they're all requiring a three or $4,000 minimum to open, that overhead in the beginning is a lot. And what Asian hair suppliers do for their own is they give them terms. So they give them 30 days, 45 days to pay it mm -hmm. back. So they're not coming up with this capital all at front, up front. Um, so for me doing the franchise model, I'm extending those same terms that I have to new franchisees. Mm -hmm. So yes, they do require credit worthiness. They do want to see cash up front because they want to make sure that you are going to pay once you take the product out of their, their warehouse. And then after that, it's just establishing a good, like with anything, you know, when you go buy, get a credit card, you know, first they start your limit off with three or $400. And then as you pay on time, you look up and then you have a $5,000 minimum. That's the same thing in this business. Same thing. Okay. I got you. Basically like a 30 day, yeah, like a building out like business credit, basically like 30 right. days. Yeah. And if you don't, if you don't know the distributors, if they don't know you, they're not willing to give you that. So they're requiring you to pay cash up front. And so that's the barrier of getting into the business is the capital. Mm. But that's what See, they I, 
I always would wonder about that because I was going, I wanted to ask more about like sourcing quality products because I know that's a, a common thing you hear like from black people, like, oh, they don't want to sell to us. They don't want to sell to us. So like, where are you finding like quality products for your stores? Or like, how, how do you source those? And you know, I just, I ask for samples. There's so many hair companies here. And when they realize that you are a potential customer, because that's what retailers are, we're customers to the distributors. I ask them, listen, if you want me to buy $2,000 worth of hair from you to open up an account, give me a couple wigs. Let me try them. Let me see if they're, if they're good enough. Um, and if they are, then that's how we do the process. So really with sourcing, I make the distributors do the work. I ask them to give me the product and they come to us as a retailer. Getting into the business, it wasn't that easy, right? Because now they come to us because we have established storefronts. Mm -hmm, yeah, um, but in the beginning, going to them and finding out, you know, can we have a sample? Can we buy a small quantity to start to see if it's something that our customers are gonna like? So it's a lot of footwork and a lot of like capital in the beginning, just finding the right products that you need to carry in your store. Okay, and I like that. And with the right products, how do you go about figuring out the demographics in like the certain neighborhoods? Because one neighborhood might prefer this product mm -hmm. over that product. So. Did you do any type of surveys or anything to kind of really figure out, okay, this will probably make me more successful in this area? Yeah, well, to be honest with you, the great thing is, is that I am the customer because I'm a black woman. So I know what we use and I have two black sisters and I have a black teenage daughter. So whatever I'm using, whatever my sisters are using, whatever my daughter is using, whatever her friends are using, that's really what it is because we are the consumer. Mm -hmm. So we're lucky in that way that we don't have to do a lot of market research. It's just like, I know from my stylist, I know from what my daughter tells me, I know from what I'm using. And then our customers talk to us a lot, right? So sometimes we'll have a braider come in and they'll be like, have you heard of this new edge control? And we're like, no. And our, our customers tell us, so we're not going out spending money to do market research. We, we don't have to do it because we got the magic already because we're the black girls. <laughs> I love the it. Message. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> got the magic already. It, man. So, uh, let's see. Okay. I'm trying to see. So I do want to talk more about uh, the Girl Cave because it was mm -hmm. one thing that I noticed you uh, you spoke on with your brand. That's something a little bit different with the beauty industry. Uh, you spoke on realistic beauty. Like that's one thing that you really want to convey with your brand. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Like how, what first, what is realistic beauty and how does your brand help convey it? Right. So the... That saying that I say is because when I was younger, I modeled. And a lot of times I would go out on a job and they would be like, you know, it's LA, like too tall, too short, too this, too that. And then mm -hmm. as a young woman, I would let that penetrate who I was. Mm -hmm. I started to think that I had to change myself every time somebody didn't like something about me. And so what I realized, not while I was in that process, but as I got older, like there is no there is no standard. Like the mm -hmm. standard is, is, is this is who I am. I can't change that. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just being the best version of yourself. And that's, what's realistic. It's not realistic for me to think I'm going to look like Beyonce, right? Like that's mm -hmm. not realistic. <laughs> um, but I can be the best version of myself. So I try to tell my customers when they come in and they show me a picture of somebody on Instagram and they're like, I want this hair and I want this look. Well, is that really what you want? Or is that what you think you want? Like, how do you what do you like? What do you like to rock? And what is realistic to you? And what can you maintain? Because um, a lot of the stuff that we do, it's not just like a one-time thing where you just go in and you buy a wig. This is like hundreds of dollars of maintenance. So what is realistic to you and your lifestyle? So that's what we try to preach at the Girl Cave LA. And you see right now, like it's Saturday, like I'm in my natural element. I have my natural hair on. And then you might see me later this week and I might have a long wig. And that's how I feel. And that's what you should be. You should do what is true to you and what feels good to you and not what you see in a magazine or on Instagram. That's whack. 